This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. On today's episode, we take a look back at 2022. 52 weekly episodes and one bonus episode. 55 guests comprising 21 artists, 9 authors, documentary film producers, children of late artists, curators, podcasters, museum heads, we seem to have covered it all. 2022 kicks off speaking to artists whose work I've been admiring for a long time, like artist Donald Sultan. In March, I spoke with Brian Alfred, an artist, podcaster, and author whose podcast I've been listening to for years. I spoke with artists like Keith Tyson and Barry Exball. I spoke to authors and curators, photographers, painters, but probably the most memorable conversation from the first half of the year was my conversation with the one-of-a-kind art critic and author, Jerry Saltz. And in this excerpt, what started as a question about vulnerability opened the door for a personal story and a pep talk for all the artists out there. Me, I, I think of, you know, in the art world, how we talk about the viewer's share, right? How it really great artwork leaves room for the the viewer to bring their own baggage, their own loves, their own psychoses in they're trying to fit their pieces in there. How does an artist walk that fine line of trying to create something that makes a statement, but at the same time leaves things unanswered? Well, another huge question. I would say to boil it all down to its nub, to say something like for every artist listening, listen to me. One, it's about obsession. Whatever you're obsessed with, that's telling you something. I don't care what it is. If you love sewing, you better have some sewing in your work. Or this magazine, or that sport, or that hobby, or this kind of love, or that kind of beauty. Obsession. Two, you better understand, artists, that whatever you do, be willing to be radically vulnerable. And by that, I mean just accept, frankly, that you are almost 100% guaranteed to be embarrassed by whatever you put out there. I'm horrified when I see myself writing what I write because I think, well, now everybody will know, one, I'm an idiot, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm wrong, my politics aren't right, my subject matter is wrong, I have fat ankles, you know, I'm bald. All that self-criticism, I'm sorry, that's just garden variety. That's something, I'm 71 years old, and I want to tell you, every artist listening, every one of you, it doesn't go away. I had a few hours of it this morning, and when I post on my uh, Instagram at 3.15 in the morning when I wake up, you know, absolutely certain that the bottom has fallen out of my writing and I should probably pack it up and go back to being a truck driver again because I have no real function or ability to be hired in the real world, nor does anyone listening to this. When I post at 3.15 in the morning, you'd be shocked at how many people in my own time zone instantly start responding. Because every artist is up at 3.15 going, I'm fucked. So, you know, we're all in this together. The other piece of advice I would give anyone listening to this is work, 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 work. You big fucking baby. Get to work. I don't want to hear about what you might do or why you can't do what you don't do. Proust said there are absolutely no excuses in art. Quentin Crisp, who lived in New York uh, in the 20th or late 20th century, said, if you've been a pig farmer for 30 years, but you're always saying, I was meant to be an artist, 
Maybe you're a pig farmer. In other words, you got to get off your ass and get to work. I didn't start writing until I was over 40. I have no degrees. I never went to school. Like I say, I was a long-distance truck driver, hopeless, miserable as you, poor as a church mouse. I lived in a squat with drug dealers' dogs prowling the hallway, and I have a fear of dogs. I was robbed dozens of times once they took off my door. But I was in ecstasy, you see? I was in ecstasy because I was by then starting to follow what I had to do, which was be willing to be embarrassed. Finish the damn things, you big babies. And finally, because I'm so long-winded and no one ever asks me about me, I would say to every one of you listening, make an enemy of envy today. Envy will eat you alive. It's in the service of the other. Its eyes are always looking out. If only I were taller, if only I were better looking, if only I had money or, you know, went to the right schools. I can't schmooze. You know, I know why she's got all the shows. I know why he has all the shows. Well, fuck you. You know more about other people than you are choosing to know about yourself. And what you do know about yourself, you're not embedding and putting and working into your work. Your work, your job, one, is to embed thought in material. That's the job. I don't care if you make a goddamn urinal and put it on a pedestal. If it hasn't somehow had your thought, your sensibility, your ideas, your whole life, your obsession, your focus, your thoughts embedded in that, it's, it's probably not what you call good. Although somebody will like everything. You can always pull the wool over about a dozen people's eyes. So that's fine with me. How big does your audience need to be? Sure. Some people are fine. Go on. No, I was just going to... I'll just go on. No, no. I've, I mean, been, tw- I've I... been alone for 26 months. I'm all... <laughs> I'm pent up. I'm pent up. So please, ask, uh, and I'll start shutting up. No, I mean, I, I, there, there is so much to unpack there, Jerry. And I... Nah. I, I, I let me just kind of start here. What, what I'm hearing is... You know, one one of the keys is the willingness to be vulnerable. And you know, I've talked to young artists about it's not natural to to want to be vulnerable. But when you are, the viewer doesn't see your weakness and your vulnerabilities; they see themselves. What I'm hearing is that the more personal you can make your art, the better. And you know, I was reading, you know, how Roberta responded to seeing your art when you found those portfolios years and years later. One of the words she used was that they were impersonal. I'm I'm gathering that the closer your artwork can be to who you are, the more successful it's going to be as a piece of art. It's amazing that you ask me that this morning. It's Memorial Day. Last day of May, 2022. It's around one o'clock in the afternoon in New York City. And I was sitting this morning on the couch with Roberta Smith, my wife, who is also who is a uh, the co-chief art critic of the New York Times. And I think the greatest art critic alive. But that's me. You may not like her work at all. Um, and out of nowhere... My brother, who I see once every 10, 15 years or so, it's not as close a family as most of you listening. We have no problems, I promise you. There's nothing to delve into anymore. Um, Happened to send me one of my drawings that I made when I was in my 20s that he has framed. I had no idea that he had it. And I looked at it. Greg, and I fell in love again. I thought, I'm a fucking genius. (laughs) It's so personal. I absolutely, Roberta's wrong. I was a great artist. I'm going to quit writing. 
now and go back to making art. Oh my God, can you believe how beautiful this was? And Roberta and was happened to be sitting next to me on the couch. I enlarged the photograph, told her where I got it, and I said, look at this. Isn't this beautiful? See? And she went, she just paused a long time as she looked at it, studied it, and went, it's okay. <laughs> and I went, okay? What do you mean it's okay? And again, what I learned in that moment, again, this morning, is while I thought everything I ever felt, thought, knew, obsessed with, you know, my past, my future, ever the bullshit that was, I thought enough of that was in the work to reach out. But it wasn't. Why? The alchemy is how do you work with the materials, the surface, the colors, the marks, your idea of space, your idea of internal scale, your idea of viscosity, your idea of everything, that bit. Look, when Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, every single person in Europe, even a peasant, would know that story. It was a common story, like, you know, as common as Jack and Jill went up the hill. I don't know. But what he did with this stupid old story was rewrite the language of young love. He made the lovers in their teens. He eroticized language. So he embedded something new in an old material, not unlike, say, uh, Dolly Parton takes the three chords of... of of the skyscraper known as country and western music and writes Jolene. And a few hours later in the same day happens to write, I will always love you. How does that happen? Like Bob Dylan said, where does that come from? You, d you just don't know. It means that you've been open, you've listened to every country and western song ever written, 10 million times, sung each one 100 million times in your head, and somehow in this alchemical moment where one in one equals three, you combine these two things, the thing that was out there, Romeo and Juliet, your personal bullshit interpretation and idea of what to do with that, and you make this third thing, that didn't exist before, that's higher than the sum of its parts. There we are at the burning bush again. You took one plus one and it made it three. You understand that anybody that walks into an exhibition goes, oh, I like this painting and I love the way they're installed and the conversation between them. And that those two things or whatever become another entity. They make you see different. I don't remember what you asked, but artists, get to fucking work. You're all going to make 90% of shit work. 90% of my work is pure shite. I've already written this morning, just again, having to cut, cut, cut. And may I say something about being rejected? Absolutely. Great. You cannot define yourself by your rejections. I'm sorry. Most of the things I do, I'll be rejected for, okay? Most of the things I think, do, and say. And I would say to you, artists listening, here's what you can do. Anybody that does say something to you negative about your work, I have a great comeback that you can try to use that kind of sticks a knife underneath one of their ribs, and they won't know they're bleeding until they leave the studio. You just go... When they go, you know, I don't know if I like this painting or something like that. You could, you just say, you could be right. And what that means is they could be wrong. And the other thing I would say to every artist is, fuck you. There's nothing bad I could say about your work that you haven't said to yourself a hundred times worse today. So, you know... Grow a pair of whatevers 
woman up, man up, they up, whatever you want to up, get to work, you big babies. And you're gone in a hundred years. I don't care. Nobody remembers anything. What do you have to lose? Being embarrassed? I already told you you're going to be embarrassed. That's guaranteed. That's the price of admi- you know, admission into the house of art. This is the streetcar named Desire Man. Just get on. We're all here. Bozo. As we move deeper into the summer, I talk to more artists. Artists like Lauren Quinn, Sarah Morris. I was in New York for NFT NYC speaking on a panel about bridging the divide between the traditional art world and the crypto art world. And it allowed me to sit down with folks like Ann Spalter, who's an artist, author, and digital art collector, as well as Kenny Schachter, who invited me into his home for a conversation about his decades in the art business as a curator, collector, teacher, writer, and cheerleader for NFTs. In July, the podcast had its first repeat guest, and that was Sarah Morris. The reason I asked Sarah Morris back for episode 56, in addition to episode 51, is because she had so much to say. And we spent the first episode talking so much about her process of making work, but I knew she had lots of amazing stories about being in the art world. In this excerpt from the episode, I asked Sarah, if Julia Schnabel made a biopic about her life, what are some of the scenes that would have to be included? Here's the first story that came to her mind. (laughs) Oh my God. I mean, I don't even know where to start. There's so many scenes. Right. (laughs) Um, Oh boy. Uh, Okay. Well, I mean, some of the, some of the things I don't even know if it's like, okay to say, (laughs) um, (laughs) <laughs> one scene for sure would be when I was asked by British Vogue to come up with an idea for Kate Moss to do something with her for the magazine. That was definitely a situation, a scene. Right. Um, I had a studio in Berlin by that point because I was in the American Academy in Berlin, which was the first year that they had invited two artists to be there and it was me and jenny holzer and jenny holzer didn't have a studio though i had a studio at the kunstler house battalion anyway british vogue asked me to do a project with kate moss by this point you know they they were treating me as if i was a yba that was also quite strange because i'm uh, you know because i'm british and american Mm. right i have two passports right so this was sort of useful. <laughs> of course, everybody thought of me as completely American, but not Vogue, um, which thought of me as British, not the Tate, which thinks of me as British. I and mean, a lot of people think of me as British. I am I am technically British because I was born there, right. but I was raised here. But um, I think of myself as American. Um, but anyway, I I really loved the work of Richard Hamilton, so I was really interested in really what he did with the White Album and the whole idea of packaging and industrial design. So what I proposed to do with Kate Moss is what anybody would propose to do with her, which is just like shoot the cover and shoot the shoot the May issue of the cover. So they arranged it. You know, I said what I wanted to have, you know, the backdrop mm-hmm. and... Um, Interestingly enough, I didn't specify any clothes. <laughs> you know, it's a fashion magazine. I didn't, I didn't ask for any clothes to be delivered, nothing, right? Because I was right. just going to bring it myself. I was going to put her in a bathing suit of mine. And I, they flew me back from Berlin to do this cover shoot. And that morning, I think I heard that the shoot was really delayed by like two or three hours and it even sounded like you know it might not even happen and i was like oh i was in the middle of working on a show for zurich for kunsthalle zurich and i remember thinking this is ridiculous like i've flown all the way back to london and it sounds like it might not even happen sounded like they couldn't reach her anyway i immediately say that i've flown back just to do this 
we've got to do it. You know, like this is my only opportunity to do it is this day. And I was really um, excited to get it over with right. and nervous and excited to get it over with. So I go to the studio somewhere in the East End and Kate shows up, had been out all night the night before. Her eyes were like incredibly bloodshot, like <laughs> an albino rabbit. And I'm thinking, wow, like this is going to be a great photo. <laughs> right. And as we're getting her prepared and I'm like doing her makeup or I'm directing the makeup artist what to do uh, with her and she's getting into this bathing suit that it was like a vintage bathing suit that I had bought in the East Village that had been made into like a shirt. Wow. <laughs> it had been made into like a, a tube top type thing. I see. And... and and I brought the bathing suit. I brought a Coke cup and I asked for this pink backdrop. And I was sort of thinking of like spring, summer, as if she's driving in a car and she'll be sipping this Coca-Cola. And Nick Knight camp comes upstairs to the studio, pops his head in. I had met him already through Peter Saville. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm shooting, I think I'm shooting the May cover for British Vogue. And he said, well, that's really funny because they told me I was shooting the British, the, the cover for the May issue. Oh boy! And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I remember feeling like I had made some faux pas or maybe he had made a faux pas. I didn't really know what was going on. Anyway, he... He um, he had he was just starting a platform at the time, like a digital platform, which actually I had titled and it was called Show Studio. He didn't know what to title it. And I said, you should call it Show. Mm -hmm. And he was he and Peter Savile used to work together a lot. So and Peter, I had asked to do a catalog of mine, my first catalog, which was for a show I did at Museum of Modern Art, Oxford. And Peter had designed it. So I had met Nick a number of times. Anyway, so Nick leaves the studio and then we have Kate and, you know, she had been out all night with, I don't know, Oasis or whoever she was out. All night with. It's like, it, you know, I was hearing the stories, but I didn't really know the first names so well, but I was trying to follow what was going on. And we, did the shot and let me just say this that the pink in the background which was like you know a really bright intense pink like I use in my paintings mm -hmm. pretty much matched the whites of her eyes like the amount of touch up we had to do or I had to go to a special place in London to handle the touch up on the photo but the photos came out great and I ended up I'm, I'm looking at an image of it right now. Yeah. I, I ended up getting the cover, which, by the way, that day I had no idea because Nick Knight popping his head in, like, Stellar Street, which was this comedy show in England at the time where, like, every single pop star lived on the same block. And they all went into this, like, deli and hung out in this, like, little delicatessen and sort of gossiped and whatever. It was a little... London was a little bit like that. So, anyway, I shot shot the cover and it all worked out but like the original photos are really extreme much more extreme than the actual photo right that ran and of course they placed a, a bar you can see a computer barcode over the bit of the bikini the bit of the bathing suit rather that made it clear that it was very vintage Mm -hmm. Like, I think they said it was Dolce Gabbana. And the art director of Vogue told me afterwards, you know, you had very little chances of getting on the cover without shooting any fashion. He said, you know, <laughs> like, actually, you know, but, but, but it was a great cover because it really was yeah. like, it looked really edgy. It was very edgy. And definitely the, the scenario in which we shot you know, at any moment, it felt like the whole shoot was going to fall apart just because the talent 
had been up all night. Uh, and you know, you know, yeah. she always she always appeared so young. I mean, and for a good part of her career, she was really young, right? But you know, when yeah. I look at the picture, you know, it's giving off these Lolita vibes, right? Yeah. And so, um, and her eyes are the whites of her eyes are very white. So. Yeah. Well, because it's like there's somebody who just who who is who only did touch up on her like by British Vogue and that guy knew how to, how to do everything. But I, I was present at the, you know, all the retouch I was there for. Um, but that was, that was a really great scene. At the end of July, I spoke with producer Debbie Wish about her documentary film, The Art of Making It. Wish had also produced the popular documentary, The Price of Everything, and had really amazing takes on all levels of the art world. Beginning of August, I spoke with museum director Ali Gass of the ICA in San Francisco. The following week, I spoke with Anne Timken, the Marie Jose and Harry Kravis chief curator of painting and sculpture at MoMA, about Matisse, the Red Studio. And if you're a fan of art history or Matisse, then you have to go take a listen to that episode. In mid-August, I had the opportunity to speak with auction world icon Simone de Perry. Simone was only available at 10 a.m. Monaco time, so I had to decide if a 3 a.m. interview should involve staying up late or getting up early. I stayed up late. We spoke by Zoom, and if you listen closely, you can hear the wind blowing. Well, that's because Simon was seated on the rear terrace of his home in Monaco, and the bank of windows behind him was reflecting the lawn and garden between him and the Mediterranean. I took advantage of the opportunity to learn from Simone just how the auction world has changed over the last five decades. You're an auctioneer and you have been in the auction world for quite a while. I believe you spent time with Sotheby's and headed up Sotheby's in d different levels in different areas for, for a matter of time and then moved on to Phillips and Phillips to Puri. How has the auction world changed over the 40, 50 years that you have been associated with the auction world? How is that world different today than it was when you first entered the space? It's become much wider and larger in, in those last 50 years. Uh, back then, it was really a field that was reserved for a small group of truly passionate and committed collectors and uh, the financial community was looking at them with interest but uh, not taking them really seriously and uh, uh, over the years the number of people who have uh, been collecting and showed an active interest in art has grown not exponentially but has grown quite substantially and uh, meanwhile all the financial institutions have accepted art being an alternative asset class and that has of course changed many things but in absolute terms even today when you look amongst the uh, wealthy people around the world still not the majority of them are collecting and are active in the art market so i think that the uh, art market still has a long, long way to go in terms of growing and getting more global. When we put a number on the, the auction world and we think 50 years ago, it, it makes me think of the skull cell that we see in The Price of Everything, the, the documentary from four or five years ago. There's this one iconic scene where Robert Rauschenberg goes up to uh, the, the collector, Robert Skull, and Robert Skull has, has profited greatly on the secondary market for the sale of these Rauschenbergs that he had owned. And Rauschenberg kind of takes umbrage of the fact that Rauschenberg wasn't really seeing that gain or uh, realize the same benefits of that secondary cell that Gull, the collector, was. You know, I, and I feel like that's something that the market is still trying to figure out how artists can benefit more from uh, the mechanics of the auction world. You see, even 50 years ago, when, uh, as I said, the market was dominated by uh, sort of a small group of real collectors, 
even back then, I have ne never encountered a collector who did not hope when he was buying something that it would not, you know, gain in financial value. I think this is a legitimate human thing that if you start spending, you know, a, a meaningful amounts of money on, on anything that you hope you haven't thrown that money away, but that in fact you, you've placed it wisely. And this, whether you love what you just bought or if, even if you bought it coldly. So that uh, has in fact always been the case. Now, uh, the artists, of course, do indirectly benefit nevertheless, because it, to go back to your example, once the uh, a work of any artist does really, really well on the auction market, even if uh, the artist does not directly benefit financially from the actual work that is then being sold by a collector at auction, uh, he will benefit from it indirectly because the gallery representing them, when they will uh, sell new works by this artist on the primary market, they will have to take into account what the public market price is for that uh, artist. And they will adjust the prices. So uh, the artist is gradually also benefiting from a increased interest for their works at auction. Um, but it is true that Ever since your example of the Skull Collection, and this has, of course, grown uh, exponentially in, in numbers, not only you know, in the amount of money, but in the amount of people uh, participating in the market, uh, you, you have uh, collectors who buy works on the primary market. And, uh, and when an artist is very hot in demand, and let's say he does a new exhibition with 15 works, you have maybe a, a, a list of 100 people who would like to buy one of these 15 works, and then it's really the gallery who chooses strategically who they feel is worthy of getting one of these 15 works. And they will, of course, privilege their most important collectors. They will, of course, also want to make sure that it goes into some public institutions. But uh, you, you will, as a um, collector, very often feel frustrated because if you're not one of these 15 people. So the lucky 15 people who just got those works, amongst them, you can bet anything that it will be one who fairly quickly will want to cash in on the fact that so many people are after this work. So what do they do? They turn around and go to the main auction houses, to Sotheby's, Christie's, or Phillips, mm -hmm. and will uh, put one of these works on the market. And then what you see, uh, if there is a strong demand for that particular artist, you will see a steep increase between the asking price uh, of the gallery and the price that that works makes because simply because all the people who were on the waiting list who were not able to get their hands on they bid at auction and at auction it's whoever pays the highest price who gets the work so um, and and that has been particularly clear over the last uh, three five four five years where we have seen massive increases for some artists from some hot artists that went literally from $10,000 right up to a million in no time at all. When I listen to your answer there uh, about the kind of the intrinsic benefit for the artist and the, the benefits for the collector, I guess one, one of the parties that winds up, I don't know if the word suffering is quite right, but that first gallery, that middle market gallery for an up and coming artist, they're oftentimes kind of in the weakest position, right? Because they aren't going to benefit from secondary market sales. And if there is success in the secondary market, their artist is probably going to get poached by a, a larger gallery. Can you kind of speak to some of the challenges that middle market galleries face in, in this sort of system? No, I, I fully agree with what you just said, because um, when an artist, you know, is, is exhibited for the first time by a uh, gallery who believes in them, by a gallerist who champions their work, and, uh, and then that work takes off, and it takes off at auction, then it's very 
difficult for that gallery to keep that artist because then larger galleries uh, have noticed what happened to the work of that artist. They have noticed the strong demand and uh, very, very often then these bigger galleries come and take those artists away from the smaller galleries that initially championed them. And in a way, these galleries suffer nearly more than the artists themselves because as I said earlier, the artists themselves ultimately uh, they they benefit from it because this increased demand at auction uh, will allow them to sell their works on the primary market for higher prices. Whereas the gallery, once it's out, it's out. And, uh, and, and it can be very frustrating for uh, some gallerists and some, uh, that have been extremely good at discovering strong new talents to then be kind of locked out uh, out of it. And that's why I feel... Uh, and that's why I have come up now with a new uh, <laughs> concept, which is to have the possibility for artists and their galleries to sell their work, also some of the work of the primary market uh, at auction, and then for the proceeds to go to the artist and to the gallery representing them, so that they are not... Uh, a locked out of that strong demand, but also, uh, yes, that they are directly benefiting from that demand. And by doing that, you cut out the speculation that is uh, happening to their detriment, in fact, because you then avoid for the uh, people to come and, and flip the work immediately and go to the auction houses and put it uh, on on the uh, uh, secondary market. So that's the idea behind it. Now, like any idea, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, you have to see how it works in, in practice. But uh, in in the 1990s, I, I was working at, at Sotheby's at the time. And uh, at one day it was decided, well, the bonus of the main uh, business winners of the company will no longer be determined solely on how much business they bring in for as consignments for the auctions but one percentage of it has to be also based on how many private transactions they do for the auction houses and since the 1990s Sotheby's and Christie's have very successfully conducted many many private transactions on the secondary market and this has become a key component of the profitability of those houses and while they never separate out the turnover of uh, these transactions but if they were to do so uh, the main auction houses would rank right at the top uh, of the list of the top uh, galleries so I always found it interesting that the auctioneers became also top dealers, whereas the top galleries who know their clients at least as well as the main auction houses have never crossed that line and have never done auctions themselves because they could do it just as, just as easily. And in a way, there is nothing that prevents a big bank from doing different things. You know, you can be a commercial bank, but you can be also a private bank. And uh, so that's the thinking behind it all. Later in August, I spoke with artist Edgar Arsenault, who has since been selected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the closest thing we have in the U.S. to something like the Royal Academy. Our conversation covered issues around history and memory. It was deep and personal in a snippet just can't do the conversation justice. In September, I had the opportunity to speak with one of my favorite figures in the art world, Matthew Collings. Matthew is an artist, writer, collaborator, and UK television presenter whose work brings such clarity to viewing art. I asked Matthew about where someone should start to train their taste for art, and the answer took us down the path of an unexpected story. In terms of, like, you've been looking at art for a long time. You know, for someone who's trying to train their palate, I mean, is there a particular ethos that you use when looking at and assessing art? I mean, is there is there something structured and formal, or has it gotten to the point where it's really all in your gut? 
Oh, I'm not sure what your question means. But if, uh, if I, you know, I reviewed exhibitions for a newspaper for a few years called The Evening Standard. And um, I would take each show that I was sent to review on its own terms. And I think I'd do that naturally anyway. So they tended to be big museum shows. So, uh, you know, but sometimes there'd be um, contemporary art or uh, and not even very good contemporary art, sometimes good contemporary art. But mainly there were things like Rembrandt and Caravaggio and, and Picasso and that. So I would think, well, what are the issues here? How do you assess this art? How, how is it meaningful to assess this art? Well, one way might be politically. Uh, but that way, that way wasn't really given to me. This is an extremely right wing paper. So I couldn't, you know, I'm actually quite a socialist. Really. I could never really say anything like that. And um, so I'd have to think, well, how do you assess it aesthetically? What's a meaningful way of assessing Caravaggio aesthetically? Well, you'd have to think about the history of art. What's his place in the history of art? And uh, how do you compare like to like? You know, what are other paintings that are like? Well, who are other artists that like Caravaggio? And then within Caravaggio's output, which are the good ones and why are they good? What does good mean? Because it wouldn't mean the same with David Hockney as it does with Caravaggio. And it wouldn't even really mean the same with Rubens as it does with Caravaggio. So you have to find, you have to, I, I, these things that I'm telling you about when I was reviewing, mm -hmm. they come naturally to me anyway. So you ask, how do I respond to shows? Well, I respond in this way. I try and think, I don't even know I'm doing it. You know, I'm, 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 I'm deconstructing myself now, telling you how I do it. But mm -hmm. it occurs to me that what I do is I approach, things turn me on or, or I'm indifferent to them according to if I find them intense and good. And I find them intense and good according to really quite classical criteria, critical, critical criteria, you know, that Saul Bellow, is good at a certain time in the 20th century and then the world's biggest bore a really boring right-wing idiot guy for 40 years or something who accidentally wrote a few good things but before that you know when i used to read him in the 70s you just didn't question his greatness and and plus by the 70s he hadn't done so much wrong you know it was, it was the last 30 years where it all went wrong so you've always one is thinking where's the intensity in the thing i'm looking at and, and so I just feel that, you know, but if I had to do some work of commentary on it, then I'd have to come up with these frameworks for commenting on it that, that would make sense to to people. So maybe that's that's two answers to your question. Sure. You really, are, how, do, how do I approach things? But as I'm a commentator as well, I, I sort of found myself drifting in my answer to how I would comment on how I, on the results of me approaching things in art. Sure. Well, n not that you would go back and in rewatch late show episodes from uh, from from the nineties, but if you did, do you think you would agree with what you said back then, or do you do you feel like your tastes have changed and evolved over the last thirty four years? Yeah, I think it's impossible for them not to. But on the whole, I do feel very connected to the person I've always been. I feel like I'm fifteen all the time. Um, I, the context of making programs, little explanatory programs to a popular audience for the BBC 30 years ago is different to some other contexts in which I've had to explain things. So I wouldn't always recognize, acknowledge or be sympathetic to those frameworks or those contexts. But what I was able to say within them, I would probably agree with. You know, it's only... I can't really think of things that I've said that that would really jar with me now, unless they're factual inaccuracies. And unfortunately, I'm often inaccurate because I'm thinking about other stuff. So I often get dates and names wrong. And maybe sometimes I've said things recklessly, which where I had a point in mind, but I didn't develop the point enough. So I sound stupid. You know, I once said that I thought situationism was stupid. Of course, I don't think that. But I said it at a time <coughs> when there was a lot of falsity around the issue of situationism. Uh, in the 90s, people were trying to make themselves seem clever that they'd heard the word situationism, they'd heard of some of the issues of situationism. And, and I was sort of rebelling against that, um, that uh, shallow connection to situationism. And, and I now feel a bit mortified when I think back to... Uh, 
I can't even remember where I said it. It might have been in a big TV series I did once, but uh, I've, I'm sorry I did that. And I sometimes wake up at night begging forgiveness from the situationist. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in that answer, you, you said that you, you feel uh, like you're still that 15-year-old. I do. And it makes me want to ask, what one time I saw you make a veiled reference to an event that happened in 1969 uh, involving a kidnapping. And uh, yeah, well, 1970. Okay, so I, 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 was, I was close. So is, is, that, is that a story you're willing to share? Because I, I, don't, yeah. think, I don't think I got all the details, but it, it sounded well, very salacious. Uh, well, it's a very important uh, milestone in my life where a woman uh, paid f for my ticket to go to Canada. And effectively, she was uh, encouraging me to run away from my single parents. I didn't have a father, the mother, who's been dead for some years now. But um, I ran away and legally this woman had abducted me. And so I was kidnapped legally. And uh, it was a press scandal it was all over the world actually and there was an interpol hunt for me in scotland yard and eventually i was actually picked up by the mounties in toronto <laughs> i was living in toronto they were technically called the mounties and then i was lying in my sleeping bag listening to country joe and the fish and on the floor oh and these six guys in suits came in like a david lynch film and they said are you malcolm carlings and they had uh the uh, they weren't wearing the red outfit they were wearing sort of fbi outfits and they showed me their badges they made me get up and they took me downtown i was absolutely terrified but i just sort of said hippie things to them and in fact i saw a um a very groovy looking black guy on a bicycle i was in the back of the police car and uh i was absolutely terrified and i don't know what was going to happen to me and i made a peace sign at him and the guy on the bicycle made a black power for a second. <laughs> and I thought, oh, my God, you know, no one's going to love me. I'm just absolutely alone here. And it was terrible. And they, um, I had to go to the Canadian remand home for some weeks. And the detective and a woman police officer flew out from Scotland Yard. And they took me back in handcuffs to Heathrow. I was met at Heathrow by loads of press all photographing me. It was in all the papers. I got some of the cuttings still. And um, then I was in a remand home in England. I was, in those days, there were skinheads and I had long hair and beads and stuff. And they used to spit at me at night. Uh, after a couple of days, they all liked me, actually, because I told them stories and you know, amused them. I amused them. I managed to, to survive, physically survive. Uh, and then the woman who kidnapped me got um, nine months for her crime and she she got out after six months and there was a guy a 21 year old very nice guy who had also had a canadian guy who got me through customs and everything and he got a a um suspended sentence uh you know as long as he didn't do anything else like that and um this woman was a very great woman who's a peace campaigner uh, an activist, a uh, uh, political activist at the time, who was in my life because she'd been a friend of my father in the 50s and she'd known my mother all, all my life and she knew that my mother had breakdowns. I'd been in a children's home when young and this woman was responsible for me sometimes being able to come out of the children's home and be in a nice environment in Chelsea, a more sort of a bohemian environment than the very grim environment I was in in the children's home. Um, she looked after me sometimes when my mother couldn't look after me. I'd been out of the children's home for a couple of years. I came out when I was 13 and a half. And by now, I was 14 or so. My mother was in a very, very bad breakdown. And this woman made a weird decision that I should just run away and get away from her. Because she'd seen I was getting involved with drugs, which I was. And it was all going to end badly. And I'd probably go to Borstal, which is kind of an English term for youth prison. Mm -hmm. And so she just made this decision, a pretty wild decision, actually. It was a bit sort of uh, over the top, really, to send me off to Canada. And inevitably, I got caught and brought back and everything. And But it, it led me to, I was put in a therapeutic community that was quite enlightened um, in the countryside for a few years. And uh, it, all this accounts, really, for why I don't have any formal education. I never really had any education whatsoever. And... Uh, at, the, at the therapy community, we didn't do lessons. We were all considered so maladjusted. We were sort of on the garbage heap of despair, really. You know, people who survived that place, um, m many of them died 
they didn't live long lives because they simply had not been brought up properly and they were, they were unable to, they didn't have the tools to, to look after themselves. And I was just fortunate. Um, so in some ways I was fortunate, in some ways I was very unfortunate. But this woman kind of coming to my rescue was fortunate, but also a bit mad when she, as it were, kidnapped me. So, yeah, that's that story. Her name's Rachel Pinney. Anyone can look her up. Dr. Rachel Pinney. She was a radical lesbian in the 60s. G- given those circumstances, where and when did you find art? Because it, it, seems like a, it seems like a lifeline for you, right? I was good at it from the year dot. And I th- it was part of... Uh, I had a sort of magic idea about it. I thought it would save me. But that was partly because people didn't bother to look after me because they thought I'd be fine because I was very good at art. And when I was in the children's home, it was clear that I had that talent and the other kids didn't. Um, and at school, I was always known to be very good. I had a sort of... Um, I, I did art that I pretty very like what I do now, funnily enough, which is sort of... Um, uh, you know, graphic, recognisable, you can see immediately what's happening. And some people just have that as a talent. It's not a it's not a rare talent at all by any means. But I thought it was. I thought it was a magic gift that I had. And it was what made me go to art school. So the, the one bit of formal education I've had, but as listeners will know, art school isn't very formal. I got myself into art school when I was 19, and I was there for about four years. Uh, but once I went to art school, I couldn't do that stuff anymore. I was too, I was confused by the whole history of art. And I, I immersed myself in reading art forum and, mm. and, and sort of introductions to uh, contemporary art. And I tried to understand what conceptual art was and what colour field painting was and what political art was and what, what photo art was and what happenings were. And so I just couldn't do that, that, that type of graphic art anymore. And I had a lot of confusion throughout my life about, um, things that I could do naturally that came to me very easily. I was very confused about valuing them. I suppose what got me into art in the first place, the, the answer to that question does relate a bit to what I'm doing now. You know, the last time, when I was about 17, I sold quite a lot of paintings for about £15 pounds each. And they were a bit like these drawings. You know, they were sort of made up out of my head and they were intuiting what people would like but also surprising people a bit, you know, whereas, but now I have a more focused idea of what people means. I mean, in those days, it was whoever, who would rescue me from being a maladjusted child. And now I think it's, well, who's the art audience? This Mm -hmm. strange group of people who are seduced by the glamour of art, to some extent by its intellectual meanings, to some extent by its soulful meanings, you know, its substitute in culture for religion, say. And, to some extent, they're seduced by its ethical sort of purity. You know, art is supposed, artists are supposed to be sincere and art is supposed to be deep. Uh, and also people think that it's talented. You know, some art involves talent and a sort of magic ability. So it's done by magicians in a way. And sometimes that audience is partly all artists themselves, which is how I began, that's how I began talking to you about mm-hmm. artists who nowadays have funny ideas about themselves. And so I'm thinking about all of those things. So, but I and I have very particular ideas which find expression in these drawings. I can see how I'm expressing them after I've done the drawing, but while I'm doing it, I do it without really thinking actually. Uh, and that's the difference between art I, I do now and when I what I did at 17, or or indeed 14 and 15. At 14 and 15, I drew like R. Crumb with a repeater graph, and I was mm. very, 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 very uh, fascinated by Crumb. And when I was 10 or 12, you know, I drew pirates and things that young boys draw and soldiers and cowboys and things. But now I, now I draw what I think art and culture consumers imagine the world to be. I, I draw what I think their values are because in a way I am them. I mean, I'm, I'm in that crowd too. Later in September, I spoke with artist Tavara Strawn, who's on the boards of both MIT and RISD, and is about as impressive a person as you'll meet. A deep thinker that contemplates the junction of science, technology, and art, while considering topics of anti-coloniality and historic figures whose stories have been overlooked. Later, I spoke with artists like John Gerard, Ange Smith, and artist Sharin Nishat, who I spoke to just days after the death of Masha Amini in the protests in Iran that soon followed. 
In episode 68, I speak to Monument Lab's Paul Farber and learned about how a monument reflects the views of whoever had the money and power to erect that monument. Episode 69, I speak with Emma Webster about using virtual reality to create amazing landscape paintings. In episode 70, I spoke with four guests on the program at the same time about the Life in Our Minds generative NFT project. In October, I was able to meet Shepard Ferry at the opening of his show at the Dallas Contemporary, and we recorded a longer conversation that became episode 71. A memorable part of that conversation involved asking Shepard about the turning point in his career and the good and bad that came with it. You know, looking at your career, I mean, there there are a number of turning points. What what do you consider the turning point there? What was the turning point the fact that you were pushed to the point of wanting to advocate for hope? Or was it the the notoriety that came off of that viral moment? I mean the, the hope poster was was a turning point in in a lot of ways, but because of the obey campaign and how really how how much that had achieved bubbling up from the underground and you know in in entering the mainstream at least here and there I, you know i felt like um part of the success of the hope poster was that i had credibility with activists mm-hmm. because of things i had done for various causes and when i embraced obama and a lot of people don't know this but i did the hope poster just as a grassroots tool on my own. It wasn't done officially with a campaign, but I eventually made 300,000 posters and half a million stickers that were given away and then had a free download of of the the vector of the image that could be scaled um, to any size without loss of resolution, which once that was in people's hands, that went viral everywhere. But um, I looked at the Hope poster as one of the first things I did that decided to endorse someone politically rather than just criticize someone politically. And so it was, it was a little bit of a risk because outsiders rarely endorse anything because if the thing or person you endorse ends up disappointing you, then, then the, then, then the entire um, perfection police will, will, um, will hate you forever after that. And, um, but that was a risk I was willing to take because I had a young daughter and a second daughter about to be born. And I was just like, this uh, underground um, purity contest is not, doesn't really achieve much in the, in the muddy real world. And I've got my kids to think about, not just my image. To answer your question, finally, after a lot of setup, sorry, um, to see what that image achieved um, virally and how people responded to it both very positively and very negatively and how it made me um, more of a lightning rod than ever, but also somewhat of a household name. I, um, I have to say that it was stressful. It was, um, it was, ex- it was exhilarating in some ways and very stressful in other ways, not just because I ended up in a lawsuit with the Associated Press about um about copyright since I, I made the illustration based on an on an AP photograph, but um, but the uh, you know the pressure when you're in the public eye. But I did learn a lot from that, and I think that you know I've I've understood the responsibility of being in the public eye and adapted um, my ways of communicating to be I think uh, more more responsible with that with that platform I have. And um, not that I think I was irresponsible, but you know, I was very off the cuff with a lot of things I would say and do. And, and um, you know, people love to quote you out of context once you're quotable. Maybe you could talk about just how crazy your life became in the years after the success of that, because, you know, you gained a, a great deal of notoriety, but you also became a big target, right? Again, you, you mentioned the AP lawsuit. It's obvious they were wanting to make an example of somebody that had a, a great deal of notoriety. And then there's also the fiasco of what the Boston Police Department wanted to do to you on the eve of your first museum show, right? 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I think they were all, um, all all somewhat related in that the Boston police also wanted to make an example of me because I um, had allegedly put up a bunch of posters in Boston and um, and I was on NPR talking about street art and saying that I chose my locations for my street art very carefully to be respectful of, of, of property, but that's always a sub- subjective interpretation. And, um, and that, you know, I believe that there, there needs to be outlets for expression in public. And if one has to bend the rules to do so, then I, I, I think that's, that's okay because there are plenty of people with a ton of power that figure out ways to bend the rules or break the law and never have any accountability for it. So I looked at it as, uh, you know, me expressing an, a, a bottom up power to the people philosophy and the Boston police were actually listening to that NPR interview and, uh, and did not like that at all. So I got arrested and charged with 32 felonies uh, on the way into my first museum show. Then shortly after that, I was hit with a lawsuit over the Hope poster. And, you know, I I frequently work with photographers and compensate photographers because I do believe that if I'm working from a reference, that often the right thing to do is to compensate the photographer. And, um, you know, the other thing I, I've done a lot of times is shoot my own photographs or work with organizations that provide imagery for me. I'm working from references, but I always felt that in in certain circumstances, fair use is essential because when you're making political statements with art, the photographer or the subject may not approve of that usage. And yet you as the, as the social commentator should still have the right. If you're, if, if you, your image you're making is visually transformative and conceptually transformative, to comment because it's a really important part of social and political dialogue in our country. So when I was sued, that's why I was defending myself. And um, the AP is a very powerful organization. They hired a really good law for- firm. I eventually settled with them. But um, I, you know, what unfortunately happened was people tried to look at this as a binary thing in the same way that people are now looking at the Lynn Goldsmith, right? Um, is uh the prince um right the the andy warhol prince yeah and um it, lynn goldsmith is a photographer i think but right. um you know where I, I i actually think that um warhol's work is a, a great it's a great example of fair use it's actually less transformative than my obama illustration was right but the you know there are gray there are gray areas and um the andy warhol foundation sitting on, you know, a, a huge um, cache of valuable intellectual and physical properties. And they, um, and, and I think that they, they should have probably offered to share the revenue from that magazine cover with, with the photographer. Um, but now if people are trying to make it binary that like, you know, let's reduce the latitude for fair use or increase the latitude for fair use or keep it as is, I definitely will side with keeping greater latitude for fair use. You know, I'm just a reasonable person and I want everyone to be happy when I'm making art. If there's any building block that came from another, came from another source, um, like there is always, whether it's science or literature or filmmaking, everybody's building on what's come before them. Right. But I just try to I just try to do what I think is the is the ethical thing to do, and I'm now in a position financially where I can I I can make sure that people are making money from the things I'm making money from. Now, early in my career, I couldn't afford to license photos. Um, I had no money, so I, I hate to think that okay, yeah, I'll uh, I'll side with the narrower interpretation right. of fair use because I have the luxury of being able to afford to license things while I'm throwing people under the bus that are just getting their footing now that work um, in the ways that almost every artist does, which is using references in some part of their process. The thing is when, when the AP came after you, they didn't come after you for what would be the $3,000 licensing fee for the photo. 
their price tag they were trying to throw at you was something rather punitive, right? Yeah, nine million. <laughs> uh. I mean, you know, you know, the uh, the the amount of revenue I got from from that was uh, you know um, very small, and then after investing in the materials that were given away. Um, I think we had 20k left, which, which, by the way, was donated to the ACLU. So, <laughs> later in November, I spoke with Mark Rothko's children, Kate Rothko Prezel and Christopher Rothko, about a book that they had produced on their late father's work. Followed in episode 73 by a conversation with artist Glenn Brown, whose work is captivating and who was a delight to speak to. In episode 75, I spoke with international gallerist Pearl Lam, who's been a fixture in the contemporary art scenes of Shanghai and Hong Kong for decades. In just this month, episode 77, I spoke with Derek Edward Schloss, who's not only a digital art collector, but co-founder of the venture capital fund Collab Currency and a founding member of Flamingo Dow. Episode 78, I spoke with Lisa Darms, executive director of Hauser & Wirth Institute, all about archiving in our most recent episode with Daniel H. Weiss, CEO and president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, regarding his new book, Why the Museum Matters. So that's it for 2022. What does 2023 have in store? I already have a ton of great guests lined up and a commitment to you to bring you a weekly podcast that presents the past, present, and future of art. Here's to 2023. That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. And if you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read the transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening.